Tung Hua is the founding CEO of Teconet, a clean tech platform that connects Chinese investments with the latest in green technology. I traveled to Beijing to meet with Chang Hua and learn how she got her start working in environmentalism. I was uh, trained as an English writer plus a uh, photojournalist. Uh, so I was majoring in English writing and uh, at my graduate school. And uh, in the meantime, I wrote my uh, graduate thesis on press photo editing. So the two coming together seems to be a very interesting combination, particularly back then in the 19, early 1990s. Uh, when the world really wanted to understand what's happening in China, particularly from an environmental perspective, but then the language barrier, right? There was a huge barrier, basic Mandarin English, not much written or spoken in English in this part of the world. So there seemed to be a perfect fit when the World Bank and the UNEP provided the national government uh, grants uh, funding for a national newspaper in English called the China Environment News. Uh, or called the English edition of the China Environment News. So I became to be probably the best fit uh, at that moment, uh, partly because I've been doing photo uh, photojournalism. Uh, in the meantime, I studied English writing. So I spoke English, I wrote English, and then I could do, do photo editing as well. Uh, so I bumped into the editor-in-chief then of China Environment News, who took on this mandate, basically you had to do an English edition. Uh, so I naturally became uh, the editor uh, of the Engli English edition of China Environment News. Uh, that was pretty much the beginning of everything, opening up the whole horizon perspective uh, for me to really know what environmental protection meant actually in China and around the world. China has to figure out how to be not only be part of the new industrial revolution, but how to lead it. Changhua is an advisor on sustainability issues for the Chinese government and corporations and has worked on the World Economic Forum's Climate Change Council. Talking about climate change, going back to 92 when you were really kind of just dipping your toe in the water to, till today, uh, the sense of urgency, um, how has that grown within you about what we're looking at in terms of climate change? Uh, it's be becoming more and more urgent uh, in a way, uh, mostly because we, sci from science perspective, we know more, right? And the scientists are telling us basically, hey, look, all those effects, right, the, the data, and uh, we literally live in it. I remember back in the 1997, during the Kyoto process, the language was pretty much sort of prevent, right? Let's do something together to prevent the climate change impact. Actually, now we literally live in it, right? And we have to deal with it. That's why adaptation becomes so important. So it's not just on one side we need to mitigate. We need to figure out how to address the carbon emission issues. But in the meantime, we have to deal with the sea level rise, extreme weather events. If you look at the bushfires, the wildfires, uh, literally now in, you know, in Australia, and so with the species, people's lives, the health endangered, and stuff like that. So the, the sense of urgency is already here, right? I feel even more so. On the other side, I think, uh, you know, uh, if you from Paul to be fair to the government decision makers, particularly here uh, in China. Uh, so if you look at the 1990s, uh, even back you know, early to the first, first you know, decade of the century, people like us in our sector would be advocating for a change, you know, uh, policy change actions there. You, you felt like you were not mainstream, right? And you feel like there's an urgency, but somehow the government was not really taking on as really the core part of the strategy. It's no longer uh, that's the case. Today, we've been already mainstream. Investment in renewals is helping China tackle air pollution, one of the three critical battles that President Xi identified in 2017, along with alleviating poverty and reducing financial risks. It's interesting, China is now the world's largest renewable energy investor. Um, you see this, I mean, it's wind, it's solar, we see electric cars, um, and yet still it's, it's kind of still grappling with pollution which shows that it, it, you can't just make headway overnight. I mean, it's a, it's a long process, isn't no, it? No, you cannot. Uh, and this is a large country. As I said, if you look at the US, if you look at, you know, from technology perspective, US is definitely leading, right? And you are still burning fossil fuels. US is not totally stay away from air pollution. Air pollution is coming back in many parts of the country, right? Let alone China, you know, if you look at the historically, where did we get all those fossil fuel industries? 
uh, in many cases, actually heavy industries there. They were transferred, transferred from, to China from US, from Europe. Why? Because you've done your industrialization process, somehow the laws, regulation standards wouldn't really allow those industries to be there, or economically, they wouldn't really make sense because the cost for environmental pollution control was just way too high. Where do they go? Rather than just phase them out, shut them down, you transfer them to China. Why? Because China was developing. We really needed, actually, industrialization to create enough jobs for this country. So if you look at China's achievements on the poverty you know, alleviation. I think the UN globally, everyone recognizes China's you know, achievements. Literally within you know, four decades, we li managed to lift almost 700 million people out of poverty. Then there is the other side, which is the cost to the environment. That's something, why? Because when those industries, outdated industries, transfer to this country, the environmental regulation and governance or the awareness of what Awareness was not there because economic growth, the jobs creation was number one priority. So we didn't really pay enough attention to the pollution issues there, right? So we ended up, you know, to, we had to deal with the legacy today and we are still trying to deal with that. It's so interesting because it was such a, a positive. I mean, uh, if you'd walked down these streets here in Beijing decades ago, everyone would be on a bicycle. Now, because of uh, this economic boom, you see a lot of people driving in cars. I mean, and it's not just China. I mean, you mentioned India. Uh, I saw uh, actually a, a presentation, I'd say maybe it was about four or five years ago, from somebody at the UN who said, you know, what we're seeing is the rising of the South, you know, like Vietnam, some of these other countries, these developing countries. And part of that development is that suddenly there's an acceleration, the economy comes up, people now have disposable income, they can have cars, they can have, and it does lead to these kinds of issues. So how do we turn all of that around? So far, humanity has not uh, been able to figure this out uh, because uh, as a species, you know, as an individual person, uh, we need the jobs, right? And uh, ideally, all the jobs out there are clean or green or smart jobs. Uh, in reality, they were not, right? We just have to manage to have whatever the jobs are out there at this moment. China, you can see China was sort of lucky enough in a way. So in the, you know, we sort of caught up with this, the very end of the second industrial revolution with the transfer of this outdated heavy industry to this country so that we'll be able to grow economically, right? We'll be able to create jobs. Did people have choices? See what kind of jobs they were, they didn't really have choices, right? I think a similar scenario for people in India, Southeast Asia, African countries, many developing countries today. So it's not to say, you know, people have the awareness. They probably, you know, if there is a very clean, great job, who would not want it? But you know, reality is reality, right? So I think now we know more and we know uh, the future. You know, we know we don't want, want pollution. We literally see the cases like the four decades developments opening up in this country. Uh, on one side, actually, uh, we made a huge progress economically. On the other, on the other hand, the pollution, right? If you look at India today, you know, often they've been comparing, you know, air pollution and China. So they are mostly in the news most often. So today, I think we know more. People in developing countries get more awareness, understanding of the issues there. Then the tough question will be, do they have enough expertise, resources, and of course, the political will? so that they will be able to really get their industry, their infrastructure in a clean, smart, low carbon manner. I don't think that part is solved yet. The U.S. Energy Information Administration estimates that the developing world will account for 65% of the world's energy consumption by 2040. But if developing countries invest in clean energy now, they could leapfrog dirtier forms of energy, bypassing heavy reliance on fossil fuels. Currently in Africa, 640 million people do not have access to electricity. Renewables could help people plug into the grid for the first time. The African Renewable Energy Initiative was created after the UN Climate Conference in Paris in 2015. The initiative aims to develop at least 10 gigawatts of new renewable energy generation by 2020, with solar taking the lead. Let me ask you about uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, what's the environmental impact of that long term, and 
And how is China working on that aspect of things? Uh, so far, I think the record has been mixed in a way. I think there were a lot of complaints from multilateral, uh, multilateral development banks and from uh, some Western countries there, basically in luck. There's a lot of Chinese capital invested under the name of the Belt and Road Initiative into coal, right? And uh, if you look at, say, 42 percent, there, there's even number, say, 42 percent of the capital, financial capital invested so far under BRI is coal related. The good thing is, so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, 10 Chinese NGOs recognized the problem. So they joined together, they petitioned the government, say, hey, this cannot carry on anymore. Multilateral banks like World Bank has been doing reports tracking the you know the records and everything like that. So evidence is provided to the Chinese government basically saying, hey, wait a second, this is not the right direction to go. So in the last two years or so, I think starting to be fair, starting in 2017, the government really started to respond, right? Basically say, okay, we need to green Belt and Road Initiative. There are guidelines uh, issued actually by uh, a couple of ministries at the national level to guide the Chinese companies when they invest overseas. They had to follow by right, certain rules, particularly from environmental perspectives there. And uh, uh, back in April this year, at the second Belt and Road Initiative International Forum, President Xi Jinping officially basically announced it's green. BRI, right? So green becomes a very important uh, sort of driver or principle for all the investment to be invested under BRI. So things are starting to change, just starting in the last couple of years. As I said, uh, if you know, I saw the pre sort of uh, formalization of BRI between 2014, 2017, the record was very mixed, right? And just said a lot of sort of fossil fuel investment there. So starting 2017, moving forward, now we're in it actually. So things are getting much, much improved, particularly now because it's lifted up to the top leadership level, the, the attention. So Clean tech has become a catch-all phrase that includes solar, wind, hydropower, as well as electric cars and energy storage. The World Bank estimates that $6.4 trillion of clean technology will be invested in developing countries by 2025, with the largest markets in Latin America and Africa. Calls for action to fight climate change have been vocal from people taking to the streets and mobilizing on social media, sometimes resulting in a bottom-up approach to policy change. Let me talk to you about some of the positives that are out there. Maybe you can just kind of, I'll, I'll throw some at you and then you can just kind of talk about them. Hainan Island, I was reading what's going on there. It's amazing. Um, Beijing Air Now, uh, which, which was written about. Alibaba has a uh, has an effort, Air Forest via Alipay. I mean, there are a lot of things not just happening from a government standpoint, but also uh, social oh, media standpoint, social, digital. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talk to us about what you see out there, these oases, these pockets of uh, hope. That's the fascinating part. And uh, I remember actually, so the current government actually is in their second term, right, the political leadership. Uh, so when they took office the first term, and uh, somehow interest because of social media. And uh, so in the social media scape, uh, landscape, there was a sort of interesting environmental movement happening, right? So 2012 was not like China just had air pollution or water pollution, right? We've been dealing with that challenge for a couple of for a few decades already. Somehow actually, uh, society through the social media space uh, sees the opportunity. Uh, because they want to get their voice heard, right? They want they, they have their expectations for the new leadership, which got coming on board actually around that time. Hopefully, somehow they will be able to respond uh, more proactively uh, to the societal demand for environmental protection. Uh, interesting enough, actually, and the leadership, if you look at Premier Li Keqiang himself, President himself as well, they responded very, very uh, actively, proactively in a way, and uh, to uh, the social media sort of, uh, uh, you know, call for actions there. Uh, so that pretty much actually in a new stage, new era. Uh, so if you look at, uh, you know, air pollution, as I said, have been there for, for a long time. And uh, then, of course, around the 2013, uh, that's the first thing, actually, the government decided to take on, you know, so they fight air pollution. So we literally, they literally declared a war on air pollution 
So if you look at 2013, the government literally released this sort of a 10-year action plan, no, seven-year action plan, and you know, before 2020. Uh, so immediately you started to see uh, the amendment of uh, air, the air pollution law, and uh, uh, there are specifically 10 action items put on the table. See, so those are gonna five, uh, 10 things actually the government, the country need to come together to really address the air pollutions there. And then, of course, you mentioned uh, Beijing Air now, social media coming on board. There are a lot of social entrepreneurs out there, happen to know so you really well. And, uh, you know, very, very ordinary sort of uh, uh, common, plain sort of, um, you know, desire. Say, I took a photo, right? I take a picture every day on the s same spot, every day at the same time, just to record, actually, uh, the air quality in Beijing. And uh, so things coming together, so we started with the air. And then right afterwards, uh, you started to see the water. So the water uh, pollution prevention uh, and the control law was amended. Again, the, air, the amended air uh, law actually was enacted in January the 1st, 2016. The water, the amended water law, uh, pollution prevention law was, was became effective actually uh, January uh, 1st, 2018. And this year, January the 1st, 2019, the amended soil contamination prevention and control law became effective. So this is sort of, a, you see the pieces coming together. You have all those sort of, old, you call it the OSIS in the society because of the technology, social media coming on board. And then that triggers the you know, chain reaction, right? The government responded and the business responding. Technology also holds the promise of greater transparency. In 2017, a Beijing-based nonprofit launched the Blue Map app to make real-time pollution data available to the public, allowing people to access emissions data from 40,000 factories nationwide. There's a platform called IPE. They do this blue map, right? And uh, they, they record actually literally uh, adopting or taking advantage of government's uh, environmental pollution information disclosure, right? Just totally using public available in, uh, information and using the you know social media technology, turn that into a map. So people started to see clearly where the polluters are, you know what, how they, how much they are polluting, whatever stuff like that. So you start to see, say, wait a second, right? Society is coming together using the technology, social media. There's a lot of continued social innovation, entrepreneurship there. As I said, the business has to respond in a way because this is affecting their reputation, right? And uh, then, uh, you know, supply chain for lots of large, you know, multinational companies there, China is a large supply chain for them, right? Many of their suppliers literally, you know, literally on the map because of the bad record uh, of pollution. Uh, so that triggered sort of uh, incentivized a lot of companies to take actions as well. So you see, you can see government, business, the society, social media, you know, really, really coming together, of course, riding on the way of, uh, you know, digital technology there as well. One final question. Um, given the fact that you've been in this game for a long time, how optimistic are you about, uh, you know, turning the page, actually really taking on climate change uh, head on? I have to say I'm now standing in the middle, right? In the middle in a way, on one side, uh, is pessimistic in a way with all the complexity of the geopolitical landscape there. And uh, as we all know, climate change is a global issue which requires multilateralism, multilateral governance there. And that part is being challenged tremendously at this moment. That's my concern, right? Then on the positive side, as I said, if you look at the technology revolution, if you look at uh, you know, the actions on the ground, even the US, as I said, the cities, states, and the companies are taking actions there. Now with the younger generation coming on board, teenagers literally coming on board and saying, hey, I care about my future, right? You guys are making leaders today, are making decisions without me around the table. But this is about, you are making decisions about my future. Now I won't get my voices heard there as well. So with all the things coming together, particularly actually at living here, I think China's leadership, China's determination commitment to continue to lead this I call it clean revolution. All those things actually give me tremendous hope. This is not far away risk. This is the immediate risk there. So somehow, as I said, um, I'm hopeful in a way, to a certain extent, I'm standing in the middle. It's a frustrating on one side. 
on the other side, I'm definitely continuing to be committed to actually to be part of the clean revolution. I'm hoping somehow more players who are coming on board will be able to really get to where we want to be, which is the blueprint, which is net zero uh, carbon emission future. And we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.